Next question from Jennifer Bennett. Uh, hello, Jennifer Bennett from Campus Review. Uh, question for Lord Monckton. You're often critical of climate change scientists because they don't like to go head to head with you in a public debate. Australian scientists have told us that a debate forum doesn't allow the time and format necessary for communicating complex information. If you're so certain of the facts, why not debate the scientists on their own terms? Why won't you submit the research you say you've undertaken to a quality peer-reviewed journal to be assessed? I wonder why it is that Professor Tim Flannery, who knows no more about climate science than I do, is never asked that question. Why Al Gore is never asked that question. Why Professor Stefan is never asked that question. And may I perhaps refer the Honourable Lady to Physics and Society for July 2008, where you will find an article entitled Climate Sensitivity Reconsidered. The author is Christopher Walter Monckton of Brenchley, and the article was indeed reviewed by Professor Alvin Saperstein, the Professor of Physics at uh, Wayne State University, and also the review editor of the journal Concern at the time. The American Physical Society, yes, that's right. Indeed it does. So why don't you check with Professor Saperstein to find out whether he in fact reviewed it. Have you done that? Why? No, I didn't think you had. Once again, please will you do your homework. What I'm saying is, if you take a preconceived position on this question, and therefore you don't check both sides of what you are told, rather than only checking my side because you're on the other side, then you will not get a balanced view on this question. Uh, the fact is that I am under no more obligation to publish in the peer-reviewed literature on this than anyone else. I have published in the reviewed literature. They try to say it wasn't peer review now, but they were perfectly happy to say it was peer review at the time. They were lent upon. This happens. You know, we too are sometimes victims of the other side going too far and putting too much pressure on. The two editors of that journal were sacked for publishing that, that paper. They shouldn't have been. It was a perfectly acceptable paper. There's not a lot wrong with it scientifically. And so read that if you want to see what my uh, opinion is on climate sensitivity. It contains 30 relatively clear equations, each one of which the professor required me to justify in order that they could be included in the paper. It was a very thorough scientific review. Thank you. Sorry, Hello. just to follow up. Jennifer, no, no, Jennifer, I'm going to give Richard Ryder a reply. Thank you. Let me start by pointing out that if you try to explain what the science says to a layman audience to the best of your ability, like for example Al Gore, then you don't need to be peer-reviewed on these statements. What you're basing your arguments and statements on already is peer-reviewed, and if Al Gore would get the basis for it wrong, he will be criticized for it, as would anyone else, and rightly so. However, if you argue against scientific findings and propose something different, then you need to go through the literature to state your case. Moncton isn't doing that, he makes his case in debates like these and outside of the peer-reviewed literature. So this is a valid point of criticism towards Moncton. But he does say that he has published a peer-reviewed paper. The article he is referring to is Climate Sensitivity Reconsidered and was published in the newsletter of the American Physical Society. And due to Moncton constantly claiming this article is peer-reviewed, they saw the need to add the following statement. The following article has not undergone any scientific peer-review since that is not normal procedure for American Physical Society newsletters. They even went further than this disclaimer on Moncton's article. All subsequent submissions that are published in the newsletter section contain variants of the following statement. This contribution has not been peer refereed. They represent solely the view of the author and not necessarily the views of APS. Mind you, similar statements have also been added to newsletter editions that were released prior to the article Moncton submitted. Quite the act to do if these newsletters contain peer-reviewed articles. This would have caused an uproar in the scientific community if papers suddenly were marked as non-peer-reviewed, but nobody, besides Moncton, raised objections to these changes. One of the pieces of evidence Moncton uses to show that his submission was peer-reviewed is a feedback document. If you read this document, it becomes apparent that the review was done by someone who isn't familiar with the subject as shown by the following comment. I don't know the difference between forcing and feedback. 
If forcing is not just external energy flux, then I would assume it includes feedback. What do you mean? The reviewer apparently doesn't know how feedback and forcing work in our climate system, which is something a peer reviewer would know. The document also shows it is just one reviewer. Peer review is normally done by multiple reviewers. Everything points to this just being an editorial review to make it readable and understandable for the target audience. The article also has some very big flaws that would have been caught during peer review. These flaws would have then been the reason the article would have been rejected for publication. Potholer54 did a good rundown on one of the errors in the article. First, let me explain some terms that you'll hear a lot. Put simply, forcing is the amount of warming caused by whatever might be warming the Earth. It could be the sun, or a greenhouse gas, or a light reflective surface turning into a darker one. The amount of forcing or warming due to a doubling of CO2 levels is pretty much agreed on by all climatologists. Richard Linson, the skeptic everyone likes to quote, says this figure is about 3.5 watts per square meter as noted in the last three IPCC scientific assessments. The IPCC actually puts the figure at 3.7 watts per square meter, but there's a margin of error, so we're in the same ballpark. When forcing increases, the average global surface temperature rises until it reaches a stage where the amount of energy leaving the Earth is about the same as the amount of energy being pumped in by the forcing. This is called the equilibrium temperature, and in its most basic form, it's very easy to work out. Temperature equals forcing times lambda, which is the Earth's sensitivity. It's usually written as delta T to denote a change in temperature in response to delta F, a change in forcing. So forcing is like a heater in a cabin, and sensitivity tells us the final temperature the cabin will reach in response to that heat. It's important to understand the difference between forcing and sensitivity, because as we'll see in a minute, Moncton gets them completely mixed up. In his piece in the Forum on Physics and Society newsletter, Moncton gives yet another figure for temperature rise, 0.58 degrees centigrade. Which one Moncton decides to settle on really doesn't matter, because we'll see that his calculation method is nonsense anyway. He laid it out in the APS newsletter piece. I'm not going to go over the whole thing, because people far better qualified than me have already done that. I'll just point out one of the most egregious errors that even the most scientifically illiterate can grasp. It concerns the figure for forcing, which Moncton initially puts at 3.405 watts per square meter. OK, this is lower than the accepted estimate of 3.5 to 3.7, but never mind, that small beer compared to what he does next. He divides it by 3. So he now gives us a forcing of just 1.135 watts per square meter. Moncton says this is to take account of the observed failure of the tropical mid-troposphere to warm as projected by the models, citing a paper by Richard Linson. But whether the tropical mid-troposphere warms as projected or not, this isn't forcing. It's sensitivity. Nowhere in the cited paper does Linson cut forcing. In fact, Linson specifically says in the same paper that forcing is 3.5 watts per square meter for a doubling of CO2. Nowhere near Moncton's 1.135. Surely no one who testifies to Congress on the subject of climate could possibly mix up sensitivity and forcing, especially in what he claims is his peer-reviewed paper. That would be like confusing time and distance, or pressure and volume. They're two completely different things. Despite Moncton claiming his articles reviewed, it's definitely not. Even his own documents don't support the peer-review claim. I doubt his article would have even passed peer review if it had been submitted.